go. Take it away. Okay, R Ricky, you want to go ahead and uh, get us rolling here? Sure. Hi, um, I'm Ricky Holston with Sunrise Engineering. I'm the, uh, the webmaster for the distribution committee. And we want to thank you guys for logging in today's, uh, this month's presentation. Uh, William Wang, where he's going to cover water distribution or um, pumps 101. Um, we do this on a monthly basis. So as things progress on, you can go log on to our website and see what the next month's presentation is. You can also do CEC's training after and see our past presentations. You can watch those anytime. If you're a member of Easy Water, you can get credit for that. Uh, you can, there's a link to email Shana if you watch something after the fact um, when it's presented now. But currently live, uh, let's tune in and see what Will has to talk about for Pumps 101. Take it away. Go ahead and hit the next slide there. Um, yep. William, there you go. As part of this webinar series that we have, they are sponsored and this allows them to be free to our members. And this month is sponsored by Arcadis. And once we get that slide up there, we'll talk a little there? bit. No, it's not. Um, you stop sharing your screen. Let's try this again. There we go. I was trying to blow it up, but I don't know why that. There we go. So my name is Dane Whitmer. I am with Arcadis. I'm also the executive chair for the water distribution uh, committee. And so my other job here is with Arcadis. I am a, a design engineer. Uh, we do. We are a full service company. We have over 110 staff in Arizona. 5,000 across the U.S. and over 120 offices. Uh, here in Arizona, we are known for doing a lot of water, wastewater at the plant, but we're also doing things out in the distribution system. Uh, currently, we have a project with the city of Chandler uh, with their, one of their water production facilities, which is a storage and booster station, uh, doing an investigation of their subsidence and, and uh recommendations for repairs. We're also doing force main assessments with the city of Glendale. And recently, uh, Janice Lusco, who's pictured there, along with Melissa Dar, is working with the city of Mesa on doing their smart metering. Last month, we presented, Arcadis presented on the advanced metering infrastructure. So feel free to look back at that to uh, hear about all the interesting things that can work with the technologies, meterings, and systems. We also have Zane Wilsterman, who is a uh, instrumentation control specialist. Uh, Kim Tanner is our local principal engineer and, and client service manager. On a national level, we are doing a lot of work and I wanted to turn some time over to Harrison Steed to talk about uh, the company on the national level and some of the great projects we have around the country. Thanks, Dane. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Harrison Steed and uh, have Arizona roots, spent quite a few years there. Uh, we're currently uh, supporting Arcadis uh, across the country in different projects and conveyance. Um, listed uh, on the projects at a glance there, you got a few other projects that we're uh, currently working on. The uh, San Antonio Water Systems Project is a multiple year uh, program and which we've, we've been uh, assessing the condition of their pipe using Ecologics as e-pulse technology. Uh, had some really interesting results uh, for you know 14 or 12 to 12 to 24 inch pipe. Um, also uh, working on a large uh, pipeline, 84 inch diameter for North Harris County, uh, which is part of their uh, major uh, program to get off of groundwater reliance here in the Houston uh, metro area. And then the Oceanside project is a really an interesting project um, about four or five miles of 24 to 42 inch ductile iron pipe. And it's actually a force main, uh, but the corrosion that we were trying to identify was external corrosion. And so we used uh, Pure Technologies uh, pipe diver to identify remaining wall, uh, wall thickness and uh, really interesting project there. 
Also shown at the bottom is the city of Dallas. Uh, they have a, about a 330 million a gallon uh, filter complex uh, replacement project. And associated with that was uh, quite a bit of yard piping, uh, 42 inch to 132 inch. There were two parallel uh, 132 inch steel pipelines. So lots of pipe, big pipe, and uh, that's, what, that's what we do at Arcade is the, the conveyance systems. Thanks, Harrison. We we wanted to let you, everyone know that we are available for, for talking and consulting. Uh, you can see our contact information. Harrison's one of our national experts. Uh, our local resources, myself and Kim, that you can reach out to, whether you need it for conveyance, electrical line C, uh, smart technologies, integrations, uh, construction service management, environmental services, we can help you with your project and being able to uh, hit the ground running and make it a success. So please remember us when, uh, when you're thinking about who you might go to. Uh, with that, um, put my AZ water hat back on and say thank you uh, for attending today's meeting. We'll turn the time over over to William Wang. Thank you, Harrison, and uh, we'll uh, get on with what you're really here to <laughs> watch. All right, let me switch this. <clears throat> Feel free to give an introduction to yourself, William, and and. Okay. Uh, let people know who you are and what you do and and uh sure. okay so basically uh just brief background on me and my company here um i personally have been working full-time here this is actually a company started by my father in 1986 but i've been full-time here since 2010 but i've been in and out of the office since i was born um you know our company really has a lot of experience with municipalities because that's the the industry my my dad targeted when he first started the company and some of our experience comes with the growth of the company um you know once once he sold enough pumps we realized that people start calling us for troubleshooting and service so then that's how we kind of got deeper into the service and troubleshooting and not just a sales company and then once you do a lot of troubleshooting and um repairs and all that stuff you realize a lot of times the issue lies in the control system so then we ended up developing our control system and getting experience with that as well so kind of just all around things related to to pumps all right so with that we'll get into today's presentation so today um it's going to go over just pump selection kind of what we look for when we go to start you know, when, when a pump station begins its life, you know, and, and consultants are starting to design these things, what things the pumps care about. Um, so we're just going to see a little bit of what we look at when we're looking for applications and selection and how all the different parts of the pump uh, affect the selection. So these are kind of the brief categories we'll be, we'll be going over. All right. So first thing we do when uh, we're presented with a job, um, with a pump station, you know, we find out first, is it water, wastewater? Uh, are we pumping chemicals, anything with high solids, low solids or no solids? You know, sometimes we, some some uh, pump stations are pre-screened. So then we can, you know, it may be wastewater, but there'll be no solids in there. So um, that also affects it. And then are we trying to pump over a hill or is it fairly flat? Are we just trying to get, make, you know, cover 10 feet ahead or a hundred something plus feet ahead? So don't, once we have those questions answered, then we can kind of move on to the next thing um, is the impeller styles. So this is slide here kind of goes over some some of the many different types of impellers that are existing. So for the first one, I, I'm going with the most common. So as far as non clogs go, the, the top left there you'll see is a single vein enclosed or multi vein enclosed. Very, very common um, in uh, for use for wastewater and non-clogs applications, sewage. Um, so those are original designs. Different manufacturers played around with it. They try to go with a straight vein 
as you can see on the left. Then they try to go with a rounder port, as you can see the picture next to it. And then the most current design, which is interesting because as you know, we kind of all, always looking at different manufacturers, multiple manufacturers, and just kind of seeing the different technology they come out with as far as non-clog impellers, several different manufacturers have started coming out after they threw their designs on computer-aided uh, um, fluid dynamics. And they've all come out with this new style impeller that it, it kind of combines a rounded port, but it's also a little bit got a curve on it. So the pumping doesn't have to make a quick 90 degree entrance and then shooting out, you know, uh, perpendicular to it on the left. So it kind of has more of a gradual uh, change of direction for the solids going through the impeller. Now onto the grinder style impellers. We have on the left also an older style, gr style grinder. So um, this is very similar to your garbage disposal in your household. It worked for a while. Um, you know, sewage has has changed from before and to the development of those flushable wipes, which you know, as we all know, has been causing problems for a lot of different pump stations. So a lot of these older designs worked well until flushable wipes became an issue, and the manufacturers have responded by trying to create newer style um, impellers and technology to try to combat it. So the grinder has taken on several different forms, as you can see. Uh, most of them also, again, you, you'll notice these are all different manufacturers and they all have, except for the one in the middle, have taken on a similar design. So the key for them on grinder pumps is to try to not attack whatever's going through the pump all at once by um, kind of projecting it away with the profile and then uh, nibbling at the solid until you break it completely down. So that's why you'll see a lot of the, the these grinders here, they don't have large cutters, they're really small sections of cutters, because then that will make it less likely to, to clog. All right, so the next type, impeller type we have on the top left here is a very also a very common one used in the past, which is a semi-open, they call it a trash pump impeller because of the large kind of passageway you can see where the impeller bolt hole would usually go and from there on out of the veins. This type of pump usually is facing the wear plate, which is right on the picture right next to it. So you have this very tight tolerance and um, it, you just it's usually adjustable and it's very, very simple. You know, the solid comes in through where this eye bolt is and then it gets shot out perpendicularly once again. Um, but also with more and more the ever changing wastewater stuck, it's likely to get jammed in between the veins and this wear plate. So some people have developed, um, you know, solutions to try to help move stuff away from between those two surfaces by putting grooves in there, by putting little cutters in there, and even allowing the impellers to move a little bit. So that's another solution from, from these type of applications. Now on the bottom here, there's two impellers that once they were designed and invented, there really has no need for an upgrade because they are just, they do their job very well at not clogging. So, but there's a trade-off. There's a reason why not everyone's using these types of impellers. So on the left side, we have a Vortex or a recessed impeller pump. Very good at not clog clogging, but very low efficiency. You're talking about your highs are probably in the 40s and your lows could be in the 20s and 30s. Um, so that's the one reason why not everyone's using this for a non-clog application. On the right side is a screw, uh, screw centrifugal impeller, which also does a very good job. The tip, I don't know if, can you guys see my cursor, the mouse cursor? Anybody? Yeah, we okay. can see it. Yes. Okay, so the, the tip right here has a shroud that covers it. So everything that comes in through the inlet is not going to get caught on the tip and it's because of its shape it gradually pushes everything through and also doesn't very clog very easily very good at not clogging so what's the trade-off here is um the expense so this type of a pump is more expensive than a, a traditional non-clog so those are the different trade-offs um, but it is a very good pump and for manufacturers the difficulty whoops, the difficulty is balancing these type of impellers 
So that's why it's not as common as some of the other impellers. All right, and then this one is also another impeller type that since it's been invented, it hasn't really need to be upgraded and nor do I see foresee it really having a, an upgrade. So this is a chopper type pump, which you have two bars here, very uh, built into a, a big ring that's casted. And the each impeller's leading edge is a cutting blade. So the chopper is not an accessory, but it's actually designed into the shape of the impeller. So that's a chopper pump. And you know, more veins give you more flow, more head, you know, um, and, and so that's why there's some small differences here. Now those are all for wastewater. When we get into clean water, when solid is not an issue, you'll see all the impellers have smaller um, openings. You know, these are all, and they're always aiming for higher efficiency. So most of the time, you're going to see they're always enclosed, okay, to reduce recirculation, to improve efficiency. Uh, with the exception of this impeller here, which is a very common ANSI pump impeller. Um, but there are, you can still see the vein, the clearances between the veins are very small. So most clean water pumps have very small solids passing. You know, three eighths, quarter inch. Um, and you won't really see them passing much larger than you know half an inch to an inch unless it's a really large clean water pump so those are all centrifugal pumps now we move on to positive displacement pumps so positive displacement pumps are good at moving stuff that's very viscous or very thick so um they're a lot of times used in sludge applications or polymer applications um and the, the theory here is Unlike a centrifugal pump where you, you know, once you hit a max pressure, it'll just recirculate at max pressure inside the pump's volume. With a positive displacement pump, each little area is being forced into the next area in a continuous loop. So it will actually build up pressure and it can be dangerous sometimes uh, as the pressure doesn't release itself unless uh, there's a, a pressure relief valve after it. Um, so Although these are all different types of pump, they all work off the same principle. They move liquid or fluid by displacing the fluid in front of it, and it just keeps that process going. Same thing here. You're going to be squeezing a small cavity of media through this stator chamber until it gets out. Um, this one also, too. A diaphragm pump has two check valves. On the one stroke, it's drawing media into this chamber. On the next stroke, it closes off this check valve and opens up this one, and displaces the, the media you are pumping. And motors, there are a lot of different types of motors. All pumps require a motor to drive it. So we have submersible motors and then a submersible drive pin motor. And as you can see, a lot of times it is just a same motor, but they put a stainless steel jacket around it and open up a couple ports here to allow media to recirculate. There's also some designs that have a closed loop cooling. So that means there's no media being transferred between the pump and the motor. And um, they have a small impeller inside here that circulates uh, almost like a coolant mix, glycol water mix through here. They try to dissipate the heat through the seal housing and into, uh, into the pump media. There's pros and cons for both. Um, for the open loop cooling, you know, obviously people, there's one side that doesn't like, you know, pumping, whether it's sewage or stormwater whatever they're pumping here to enter this area. But in reality, it's the same thing around here. If this was a regular submerged pump, it's this being surrounded by the same media. Um, the one advantage to open low cooling is it, the motors will run cooler because the, you're having constantly cool media running across the surface area of the motors and being shot out of the pump. So uh, the one, one disadvantage of a closed loop is it will run a little bit warmer and there's more components for maintenance. Some people, you know, they want as few components as possible when they come to rebuilding these motors. So those are just some of the pros and cons of different types of designs. Um, when designing a motor or selecting a motor, there are a lot of different types of enclosures. There's an open drip proof, which have vents located around the motor, which um, allows, you know, these are usually used indoors, an open ODP or open drip proof. Um, because if it rains, if there's a lot of dust outdoors, it gets into the windings and easily and you can 
have a shortened life on your motors. So here is a picture of a TEFC motor. It's closed off very well. It has fins to help dissipate the heat since air is not really blown across the windings. Um, inside this back cover here is actually a little fan and it draws air in through the back and shoots it across the surface of the motor to keep these motors cool. And same thing for vertical motors. They all also have ODP ratings, TFC, and also WPI, which stands for Weather Protected Enclosures. Um, so TFC is definitely the best rating. Um, WPI is basically a, something terminology more used on vertical motors. It is still good for outdoor, but not as good as TFC. Pump protection. So with every pump that's being sold, typically there is a way to protect it or at least have some uh, sensors on there to try to diagnose it with early detection of failure so you don't run it till failure and, and then now you're reacting because most of these pumps for cities, if they don't keep one on as a shelf spare, a lot of times they're, you know, 10 weeks, 16 weeks and something like this in this picture is a three stage split case pump for LEDWP. You know, this type of pump takes 24 weeks to build. So um, William, we have yes. a question. Um, okay. Oh, sorry. I think we got the answer. What does TEFC stand for? Totally enclosed fan cooled. Yeah. So you can see the windings are totally enclosed and not exposed to the environment and then fan cooled because there's a little fan in the back right there that blows it across. Yeah. All right. OK. So on these, um, like I said, they take 24 weeks, so they have a lot of protection built in. They have um, a little bearing RTD sensor mounted on each bearing. There's four here, right? Two on a motor, two on a pump. And they also have a vibration sensor on on the bearing. So they've updated their spec, DWP. They used to only put one on the inboard. Now they're putting these vibration monitors uh, on each bearing. So this is an older job from, I think, 2008. Um, so you can protect your motors through temperature, through vibration sensors. Um, that you know, That's basically all protecting your bearings. And then thermal, you can protect it through uh, the thermal sensors as well. And then you can monitor amps on your motor to see if they're running at the correct amperage or if they're overloading. And so there's a lot of different ways to protect your motor. On the pump side, you know, you have mechanical seals that you want to protect, bearings again. Um, some manufacturers have uh, monitoring for impeller vibration. So you can kind of see the deterioration of your impellers through that route and rusting obviously corrosion by paint and um, there's also ways to program your controls to have a little exercise timer in there if uh, you know that the pumps won't be in offer soon so a lot of times storm water pumps in southern california we have long periods of of where there's no rain those storm pumps can become seized uh, during the off season and when it hit that first rain none of the pumps are working so sometimes um, exercise timers are, are built into them to protect the pumps and the, once we have all those um, criteria kind of talked about, then we go to select the actual pump. And when we select the pump, we're looking at performance curves like this. And um, you know, most of the time it's generated through a computer software, so it's very easy for us to help you know provide these type of curves and, and get all the data we need. So these curves here are your performance curves. They kind of show what each pumps, these are the same pump with different impeller sizes. So with the bigger impeller, then you're going to have more and more uh, coverage. You're going to be able to put out more. And as you put out more, you'll see on the bottom here, your horsepower requirement increases with each impeller size. And then obviously there's different efficiencies for, for each impeller size as well. So when we look at this, we usually want the duty point within the center third of the BEP is ideal. That's that's usually what the manufacturers call the preferred operating range. But you can also see that there's these darker lines and it still stops here that what they call an acceptable operating range, meaning sometimes there's just a duty point that is very hard to hit 
and there's no good pump selection for it where we can find it in the third, and you do end up being on the outside closer to the left or closer to the right, um, you may have shortened life compared to something that's picked in the middle, but it'll still work. It'll just get the job done, but you probably won't be able to, you know, maybe a pump selected closer to BEP can last maybe five, ten years or maybe even longer. Um, something that's a little bit closer to edges may vibrate a little more, so you might lose a couple years off the longevity of, of the pump. And um, let's see here, cover most of these. And MPSH curves are going to be covered actually in the next slide, I believe. Um, also, this one comment here, bigger is not always better as far as pumps go, is because most of the time you'll see a lot of pump curves, they kind of cut off a little bit higher with each bigger impeller. I don't, and the reason, so that means if you have a bigger pump here with a, where the curve cuts off here, and your duty point is a little bit lower, then you're going to be running off completely off the curve by trying to go to a bigger pump. So I think I have another curve later on, and we can um, definitely use that as an example. All right, so net positive suction head. This is basically pumps are very good at pushing water out of itself. So better, so good that they're not able to get the water in as good. So basically, um, in submersible pumps, you don't see this as much of an, as an issue. But when you have uh, above ground pumps, such as something feeding from a tank or something drawing from below, like here is a self priming pump, these are the most important ones to calculate your MPSH correctly because they're drawing from below. There's a typically uh, a lot less MPSH when you're you're drawing from water from below than, than when gravity pushes the water into these pumps. So most manufacturers will have developed an MPSH R required um, pump curve. So and then the MPSH can be calculated. So you just got to make sure your calculated MPSH is above what the manufacturer has recommended as a minimum or as a requirement. So that is for that. And fluid velocity. So once we're done with the pumps, one thing that we always kind of look for as well is right downstream and upstream of the pump. We want to make sure velocity and pipe sizing is done correctly. Um, on the discharge size, you know, it's it's um if you wanna you wanna maintain around five feet per second, you know, max to about maybe seven and a half feet per second max on wastewater, because if it's too fast, you can start kind of almost like abrasive blasting your check valves, especially if they're swing check valves. So I've seen some premature failure because of that. And then on clean water, you can definitely go a little bit faster um, on your velocity. So that. And you also don't want to go too slow. So there's a minimum scaling velocity of two feet per second. If you drop below that, solids inside the water and pipe will settle to a low point instead of being washed through and dragged through on, and pumped out. So you have to make sure you don't go too fast and also not too slow to make sure your pipes stay clean and you get longevity out of your valves. Um, let's see. Let's get here. All right, so when we most a lot of pump systems, you know, are in a parallel pumping configuration. So you'll have maybe like four of the same pumps and they're all rated, let's say, for 100 GPM at a certain TDH. And when you have two pumps turn on, though, one thing to know is you see these system curves. Doesn't really it, it starts picking up exponentially. So a lot of times if you have one pump, 100 GPM, second pump also 100 GPM, but you won't hit 200 GPM on a parallel pumping system. You'll probably get maybe 50% due to the increased friction loss from the, the increased volume. So if you have two 100 GPM pumps, you're not going to get 200. You probably end up somewhere 150 or something like that, depending on your system curve. So here's another system curve. Once again, if you're getting, let's say, 150 here and you're expecting another 150 from the second pump, you're not going to get there. You're going to get a little bit less. Next, we talk about pumps pumping in series. So one pump pumping into another is very similar to a multi-stage pump. Um, so you can create a certain amount of pressure with one pump and, and the next pump will start off at that pressure and add the same pressure. So 
in the parallel pumping curve, you will be able to get, you know, the extra pressure you want to add. So 250 PSI pumps will be able to get you pretty close to 100 PSI. So, and another thing to consider when we have pump stations is, you know, if it's pumping down a tank or pumping down a wet well, there's a static head change. And with that change, you want to make sure your pump can cover both points. You know, if your curve is short or, or you know, flat, you know, when, when, the, when the water gets lower and your pump starts to work harder, you may not be able to pump past it if the curve is, is not able to cover both points. And then friction head change is also similar to what we talked about with more pumps and more volume, your um, friction loss will increase. So your, your TDH increases. So what happens when you run to the left or to the right of the curve or not in, enough MPSH? You get cavitation. So um, you can tell by a lot of times looking at the impeller, there'll be damage. It looks like pitting on the inside. That'll be a suction side cavitation because there's Basically, when you don't meet the MPSH value, you're forming almost like a vacuum, a perfect vacuum around this inlet, eye inlet area of the impeller. And if you, you know, look at the boiling temperature of water, and you know, it's affected by pressure, right? So if you go to high altitude, you have less pressure, then you know your water boils at a lower temp. Well, if you have a vacuum where there's almost no pressure, your water will boil at room temp. So basically, you have water turning into a gas and then coll collapsing back down into a water molecule constantly inside the impeller, and that's what causes a lot of damage to the inside of the impellers. Um, vortexing can also lead to bubbles. Um, that's when you don't have enough minimum submergence. Um, so that's that's some of the indications of suction. What suction side impeller damage tells us. On the discharge side, you'll see it, the damage more towards the tip of the veins. Um, that's just caused by high recirculation inside the housing. Instead of being able to throw the water out, it's just kind of recirculating inside the housing. And the next step is once we make sure all the pumps performance and everything is selected right, we have the right pump for the right application, we have some configuration to do. Are you pumping, um, you know, acidic water? Uh, is it uh, hot temperature or anything like that? You know, is there? Are we expecting a lot of grit for grit pumps at a treatment plant? So there's a lot, there's different factors, and there is a pump designed for each of those, you know, issues. So if you have corrosion, there's a lot of stainless steel type materials available to to build your pump, and if it's erosion, you can use a hardened metals. Um, they have like high chrome and uh, nickel chromium, you know, those, so to combat erosion. And as far as temperature goes, most metals are not affected by temperatures. But sometimes if it's a tight tolerance, you need to make sure um, expansion, those pumps are designed. So they may have a little bit larger clearances to uh, for high temp. Most of the temperature effects will be on your mechanical seal and your elastomers for all your o-rings and your gaskets and all that stuff so um well, i think i have a section on seals later so we can get into that as well so this impeller here um typically when i do this you know presentation i ask people to guess how long this pump uh, impeller was in service but since uh i'm not in person here i will just let you guys know this impeller was only in service for about a year and a half to two years. And obviously, this type of deterioration is very severe. Your veins are almost completely gone here. to shrouds. There's like paper thin. It was designed for 3,000 GPM. By the time the, the client called us and we went there to go take a look at what's going on, we opened up the pump. We saw this impeller in there. And um, you know, immediately, we knew there's something wrong with the material selection. So. Amazingly, this impeller was still putting out about 1500 GPM, even though it's severely deteriorated. Now, what happened is this is a regular bronze impeller or a silicone bronze, I should say, um, which is not good for any water with um, chlorine or chloride or something like that. It, it will leach out a lot of the materials you can see and just cause it to, to fail fast. So 
we replaced this impeller with a nickel aluminum bronze. Um, and then we checked it again after a year and then after the second year and with the right material, the impeller still looks brand new. It looks like the day we put it in. So the difference, you know, in material configuration could be years and years of service out of one impeller versus a year and a half of, you know, catastrophic failure. Um, also, a lot of times it's expensive to make everything a bronze or everything a stainless. So a lot of things that aren't, you know, high, a high wear item, you can coat it or treat it with hardening, um, different things to do to kind of improve the life of the pump. All right, so mechanical seals, there's a couple different seal faces out there. For clean water, when there's no abrasives, uh, your typical carbon ceramic it works very well. You know, even though it's nothing fancy, but it will still get you five, 10 years out of the pumps. I've seen it many times. Um, once you get into wastewater and abrasives, you're gonna, you'll are gonna you see the two common materials is tungsten carbide and silicon carbide. Um, with uh, tungsten carbide, it's more of a metal-based carbide, so it, it still has a little bit of, um, it's not as good as silicon carbide. The reason being, silicon carbide is just a little bit better at resisting heat shock. So let's say you run a pump dry, uh, no one knew is overnight, and the pump's been running dry, the seals are super hot, and you realize it's been running dry, you found the problem, maybe there's a closed valve or something blocking the inlet. Now you unplug it and all this cold water is rushing into your pump. So a lot of times that'll cause your seal to crack. So silicon carbide has a better resistance to heat shock. So it won't, it was less likely to crack when it goes from extreme hot to extreme cold. Um, let's see. And then another on, you see as, as all mechanical seals, there's a rubber component to these seals where there's an O-ring inside here, you know, or, you know, O-rings here. There's always O-rings on a mechanical seal. So the standard material, a lot of time is a buna N nitrile, um, which works well, it goes up to a couple of we got the exact temperature range, but it still gets up there pretty good. Um, the a common alternative or an upgrade to Buna N is a Viton elastomer. So now you can get up to a couple hundred degrees, and also it is a better corrosion has better corrosion resistant properties. And you can see there's a lot of different types of seals. So on the top right, that's your standard type one, type twenty one component seal. Um, on the second, starting on the bottom, second picture, you see a split seal where they have this uh, housing that a lot of times they like to use on either vertical turbines or horizontal split case pumps. So they don't have to take the pump apart to change out the seal. Um, so how this is done is they have a seal made just like a normal seal. Then they precisely crack it down the middle. And that way the grooves fit back exactly when they put this thing back together. And then this is a very, on the third picture from the left, that's a very common setup for submersible pumps across almost all the different submersible pump manufacturers. They have two seals, and then there's an oil chamber in between with a oil sensor, uh, a seal leak sensor in there that detects water. So when your bottom seal is, you know, typically your bottom seal fa fails first because it's in contact with um, dirty water or sewage, whereas the upper seal is in contact with a constant clean oil bath. So once the lower seals start to fail, it, water will get into this chamber and it should set off a seal leak sensor alarm. Then you know that you still have some time before this second seal goes out. But at least that gives you a heads up and then you'll know it's time to send this pump out for refurbishment. And um, another pump, that's an alternative. Um, another seal on the far right, bottom right here is just a cartridge seal. So it's um, basically a component seal that's been kind of preset into this seal gland where your spring tension, everything's all preset. You just bolt the gland up to the pump and um, it's ready to go. You do have to secure the little set screws for the rotary component to the shaft. So that's, that's a it's it's um it's preferable because it makes changing our seals a lot easier. Um, some of the precautions and design is just you know that we we look at, we make sure 
as I mentioned before, we look at MPSH, make sure um, there's no water hammer. Water hammer can be caused by sometimes also excessive velocity. So when your water in your pipe is shooting really fast and um, then you turn the pump off, now all that fast water is going to change directions and come back and it can slam on, slam on the valves. Um, and then a couple of these were all covered already, so I'll go on to the next slide. Okay, so pump operation and maintenance. Uh, actually, does anybody have any questions or uh, feel free to ask questions and then uh, as I go through this. So I will get through the next slide. Okay, so pump station operation. There's one in the chat, man. Uh, chat. Okay, let me see here. Oh, I can't get out of this to look at it, but uh, it was, it was uh, uh, can, can just, just explaining explain pump, pump efficiency, efficiency a little bit more. Okay, okay. So I think I'll have another performance curve slide, and I can I'll catch up on that on that slide. Okay, so as far as operating a pump station, now the pump's been selected, the station's been built um, on a daily operation, you know. We just want to make sure the pumps put out the right pressure it's designed for, the right flow rate it's designed for, uh, and that nothing's overheating. And then as far as the valves, they need to be exercised a lot of times because they will seize or rust into a position either in that open position. And when you need to close it and isolate something, it won't work. Um, and then air release, you can see, you know, before check valves is quite important. A lot of times you get something called... Uh, terminology slipping me but you'll get like an air bubble stuck between the right before the check valve and it will not be able to open up the check valve oh airlock you get something called airlock so it's good to have an air release valve right before your check valves and also have a check valve so that uh, each pump always needs its own check valve um, you know I've seen some systems where you know people call us and they can't figure out why their system's not working there's no check valve so in that situation what's going to happen is if it's got a common header and the pump, one of the pumps doesn't have a check valve, it's going to pump into the common header and come in through your other pump. So now you're just going to have this circulation going on between your suction and your discharge. Okay. Um, maintenance as well. Um, submersible motors don't have any bearing maintenance. They all come usually packed with uh, permanently greased bearing. So you, they pretty much just run their course until they they fail and uh, there's no way to continuously lube those uh, uh bearings um once again exercising valves and and pumps if they're going to have long periods of isolation or not well, not working um checking for leaky seals um if the seals are leaking you know order some seals it's good to keep some in stock because they can be catastrophic failure sometimes and now you're just shooting water out all over the, the pump. Um, as far as maintenance on controls, um, probably less common, but um, it is still pretty important, is keeping the enclosures clean. There's, you know, usually accumulation of dust, spider webs, and, you know, all that stuff. It should be cleaned out, blown out, vacuumed out. Uh, it'll keep your control systems running longer. Uh, dust can also kind of retain more heat. Electrical components does not, do not like heat, so... The cooler you can keep the control components, the better. Okay. All right. So as far as efficiency, so basically, pump efficiency is a lot of times is a calculated number from an equation. Um, so it'll take how much GPM you're pushing, and then how much uh, head you're pushing. And then how much horsepower power is required, and that'll give you these all these different efficiency numbers. So at all these different points, you see all these different efficiencies. Um, so that just tells you how effective this pump is, you know, at pushing the water or the wastewater out. Um, that's pretty. That part's pretty self-explanatory. The other part is what sometimes I tell people is. There is, even if you're, let's say you're efficient and you're using a 15 horsepower power motor to power this 15 horsepower submersible pump, you may have a, a 
another point, you know, 70% or, and then the competitor may be like a 65%, but they're both 15 horsepower pumps. So what does that mean? That just means that the curve, if it was there, only needs, let's say, 13 horsepower, right? Or somewhere here, it only needs 12 horsepower. But they don't, manufacturers don't make motors in every single increment. There's no 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 horsepower motors. So even though your pump hydraulic side has an efficiency of maybe 65%, but you still cross the threshold of, let's say, a 10 horsepower motor, so you, you have to bump it up to the 15 horsepower. So there's two different kind of efficiencies going on. I mean, there's hydraulic efficiency, and then there's your motor efficient that you actually have to use. Um, and the motors also have their own efficiency. So, you know, your motor is not going to be 100% able to convert all the power that's putting it in to the output. So a lot of times, there's actually, you'll see two horsepower ratings on a motor. There's an input horsepower rating, and then there's an output house port, uh, horsepower rating. So, and then usually that's just some, um, there's also some losses internally to the motor. Uh, so like a 98% efficient motor will, you know, if it's, it's, it's putting in and trying to develop 100 horsepower, it'll put out 98 horsepower. So... A lot of times people will try to um, say there's a wire to water efficiency, which they just take the efficiency of the motor times the pump efficiency somewhere on this graph. And then that's called a wire to water efficiency. And um, that that kind of goes over that. Uh, any any does that answer your question or. Yeah, it, it was good for me. I just thought it'd be good for the group. Okay. Kurt, okay, good. So, um, since we're still in uh, troubleshooting with performance curve, so when a pump, it, when a, a performance curve is very, very useful, you'll see most pump people, once they get out, if they're, if they're called out for a troubleshoot, most of the thing they're going to bring with them or ask for first thing is going to be a performance curve uh, because a pump will always be on the curve no matter what, if it's if it's in the right condition. So meaning, um, well, we'll just go with that first. So if if I'm pumping and you know there's no pockets of air, nothing, it, it is moving water, but let's just say it's moving a little bit less. Then I let's say we we wanted to go around a thousand, but now we're only getting eight hundred. I can say that the cause of that is, you know, you wanted a thousand at one hundred twenty feet, but the site conditions from the calculated conditions have increased so maybe there was a a hill that was unaccounted for or a little something that was unaccounted for so now you went from like 120 feet of head to let's say 130 and it will follow along the line the decrease so you can pinpoint your pressure your tdh from two both ways so if i see that you know i'm only getting 800 and we have a performance curve here that shows me it's at 132 i can tell you that you're pumping out this at this height and reverse also is if we don't have a flow meter and you can only tell me that I only know it's uh, it's 120 feet because maybe we have a discharge pressure gauge that show, that we can convert from PSI to feet. Then I can tell you, well, uh, this pump, we have 120 feet and it's going to put out 1,000 GPM. So that's the first thing, you know, the easiest way to use a performance curve to kind of troubleshoot what's going on with your volume, with your pressure. Now, there are instances where the point's not on the curve, and that tells me an entirely different thing. So um, one thing, if it is plugged, you'll see you'll get very low GPM, and you'll see high pressure, right? What if um, we're off the curve? So in an off-the-curve situation is sometimes you have a plug on the suction side, you don't even get enough water into your pump, and it's just kind of creating this weird pressure. So that's one way. Or we can tell that the impeller size is wrong. So maybe we were basing all our calculations and whatnot off of a 12-inch impeller, but for some reason the duty points here and it matches this here. If it falls on this point, then we can tell, hey, you know, the, the impeller size is wrong, which I've seen happen before. You know, um, another thing is the lower the flow on any curve, part of curve or any part of the curve, the lower the flow in general, the lower 
the amp draw, and that includes a plug line. So a lot of people think, oh, my discharge line is plugged. That'll cause the, the motor to work harder, or you, know, you should get a higher amp draw. Actually, that's not true. When you have a pump that pumps zero GPM with a motor that's supposed to be rated for 100 you know, amps, you're going you're gonna to have similar conditions to a, a no-load amp instead. So you might be drawing like 50 amps at, at when it's plugged because you're moving zero GPM. And the best way I usually explain that is with um, with the motor, with each um, each pound of water, is, uh, each gallon of water is about eight eight pounds, right? So when you're moving zero, you're moving zero weight on the motor. When you have a thousand GPM, then you're moving eight thousand pounds per minute because these are still gallons per by minute. So that's why the further right to the, of the curve you go the more horsepower you're going to need. That's why it cuts off here. See, on this side of the curve, you'll need, let's say, 50. Now you're probably more and more. You're, you're across the horsepower requirement line into the 60 horsepower. So the more uh, flow you, you um, are pumping, the more horsepower. So that's why you can also tell if, if you have a broken discharge line. Maybe it's 100 feet up. Now it's broken at the 50 feet mark. You can tell also that you're overloading your motor. Um, as far as problems, let me see. I think I'll skip this one in real quick. I noticed we're a little short on time. Um, as far as controls, um, like I said, we just got to keep them clean. You can design it for however many protection you want. If you want to monitor thermal, you can monitor thermal. If you don't, you don't have to, right? I mean, and so controls are very customizable. So the more, you know, music, I know a lot of municipalities like more monitoring. So you can add a bunch of different monitoring. You can monitor vibration, temperature, seal fails, all that stuff. Um, and all their individual components here. This is listed, you know. Um, so basically, controls are just open and close signals. You know, you have a float come up that triggers a contactor that closes your pump on. And then when that contactor goes off, it shuts off your ear. And that's the basic explanation of how a lot of these controls work um, and then if you have an analog readout it's um, like this meter here then you can it's called a 4 to 20 milliamp signal and that's just a range so uh, you can calibrate your signals to match and then you can get a, a 4 to 20 amp signal that will work with your control system Yeah. Is there any questions? Because I noticed it's uh, I might be running into extra time here, and this is all um, just very general. Dane, anybody? I don't see any questions. Go. So feel free to move on and finish up. Okay, okay. Yeah, this is pretty much my last two slides was the control system. So basically all the pump protection that, you know, is available, you have to connect it into a panel. Now, as silly as that may sound, I just ran into this issue yesterday. I have a pump that has a thermal and seal contact. They don't have that provision inside the panel, so they, they have no way of hooking that up. Um, pretty much a lot of things to check for is also your overload ratings. Make sure those are set correctly to match your motor. So if your motor has a full load amp rating of 100, make sure your overloads are set at 100. Um, that way you they, they shut off because if you're in a jam, every time your motor jams doesn't mean you're going to burn out your motor if you have the right protection. So if your full load amp on your motors are 100, and you set your overloads at 100. When it jams, it's going to jump up to like 200 or 300 because usually a lock rotor amp is about three to five times your full load amp. So if it's 100 amps and it jumps up to three, 400 amps, these overloads will trip, thus protecting your motors and avoiding a costly motor replacement. Um, some people, you know, they forget to set them during startup or they just max it out because they don't like how it keeps tripping and, and that's just band-aiding the issue. The issue is there's something wrong with the motor. Maybe it's a bad bearing. Maybe there's a dragging impeller, um, and they just turn up the, the overload ratings to like 300 or 200 amps. Now it's never going to trip until it burns out. Um, let me see. And that's that's pretty much it. I'm 
think that's that's all I got. So just the questions section now, if anybody has any questions for me. Otherwise, that's it. If you I have any have questions. questions. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, if you have any questions, feel free to write them in the chat or unmute yourself and, and ask William uh, anything that you'd like to have covered. The purpose of these webinars is, you know, to help anywhere from the basic to the complex. So uh, all questions are welcome. Um, so please feel free to, to ask away. Or there was something that might have missed you want to go back over. Yeah, if there's anything we can go over, just let me know. Okay. All right. I'm not. I'm not seeing anything come through. Uh, if you don't, I'll go ahead and close out this group. Uh, I want to say thank you for every for everyone that's participated. I want to say thank you to William for uh, taking the time to come through here and and give us this presentation. I appreciate these times for uh, the technology that we have. Um, hopefully, we'll get past this and maybe we can shift these from going online.